Listen to this inspired insider.com interview with Brian when he breaks down what he needs to do to be a better manager and what he's doing wrong. You may be doing the same things. Also, Brian talks about one of the best pieces of advice his mentor gave him, which allowed him to get his business to the next level and also step away when he needs to and look at the big picture. Also, at the end, listen up what happened when he was a young kid and why he thinks that he now focuses on great customer satisfaction. That and much more coming up now. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Brian Kaldenberg. He's founder and CEO of Proofreading Pal. Now, Proofreading Pal, just a little bit about background about them. In three years, they've grown from just Brian and four contractors to over 30 contract proofreading uh, proofreaders and five in-house employees. And Proofreading Pal should do over $1 million in gross sales in 2013. Congratulations on that. That's awesome. Thanks, Jeremy, and thanks for having me. Yeah, and I always like to include a fun fact, and Brian's not that quirky, so it was hard with this one, but um, he ran a business game rosters, which was busy three months out of the year, so the rest of the time he could do what he wanted, and he, I guess you could say, had a slight video game addiction, and sometimes he would end up playing video games for eight hours, specifically NCAA football. Is that right? That's... That's right. I wouldn't. I don't know if I'm. I'm not too quirky, but that was. Uh, <laughs> um, that was certainly yes. Those were the my early days out of college. I was fortunate enough to have this business that I started online that made more money in three months than I would make if I went and got a full time job in the corporate world. Um, and I, me and my friend, he lived in Florida. We'd play online against each other. Um, it, it was it got out of hand, and we played for money. Um, you, I got addicted. I I do I have a little video game addiction, so I I quit playing video games 100 percent about four years ago, um, which is which is which is which was a good thing. Cold turkey. Well, those were the good old days. So we're gonna talk about nowadays where you're not playing video games. You're focusing on on proofreading, pal. And you know, the topic is what should founders and businesses learn from some of the big mistakes and challenges that we go through because oftentimes people are you know asking me like they have an idea they're not sure if it's not getting traction should they you know cut their losses and persist with it and you know some of those valuable lessons come with when we make mistakes so i want you to tell the audience when is what was two big mistakes that you made in business that were painful for you well first of all um the first mistake that I probably made was I got I allowed myself to get sidetracked by little ideas that um, I never was I don't think I was ever passionate enough about to begin with and they and they just ended up becoming time sinks um, uh, one of those ideas I had in my game rosters business was was doing well and I had a customer base or a mailing list of over 20,000 people and I want I wanted to start a website called discount controllers and um, figured I could use my base to they they all all these people play video games you know you can buy my cheap controllers from China and save money and it, it just it didn't work because the controllers were crappy first of all but then I did not I just didn't put the time and energy into it, um, and sidetracked by little. Just allowed myself to get sidetracked. I wanted to stop a. I wanted to create a stop video games website um, to to teach others how to play video games or stop playing video games rather. And um, so if if I could have got rid of all those idea those those time sinks and just focused on. Um, the main successful business I had at hand, I think I would have made a little bit more money when Game Rosters was really, really doing well. Um, the other mistake that I think... Real quick, before you go into the other mistake, fast forward to today with that, trying too many things at once. How have you applied that and held back on now that you're a proofreading pal? 
Well, I, I, uh, number one, um, I still have these urges. You know, I, these ideas still come, um, and I'm just better able to get them out of my system quickly and, and not pursue them. Um, and I think, I think if if you're, it, it depends. Like, I think it's a that's a mistake if you're trying to start a business with hardly any funds, because your time is one of your greatest resources. Um, as you become more established financially, maybe you can uh, let your ideas, you can go after these other ideas if you're going to use money and, and hire other people to do them. Um, but now with Proofreading Pal, I, I still am, uh, time is still one of my greatest resources. Um, and so I just, I know I can't get, I can't get involved with that. I need to focus on Proofreading Pal. And um, we do have some other ideas, uh, some other closely related uh, sectors of business, such as translation and transcription, that we want to get into. But we're not going to get into those until we get more funding. And then we can, instead of, we can either, we get this business to a point where it's successful without me 100%, then we can run into that business. Um, so to say the urges don't come with, with different ideas, they still do. It's just um, learning from my past mistakes and not going down those roads again. Right. Yeah, that's a good one. What's, uh, what's, what was the other one that you were going to talk about, the other big mistake? Uh, the, other, the other mistake would be when I first got to the point um, where Proofreading Pod had grown to where I needed to hire our first employee. Um, didn't do a very good job of, of posting the job listing, didn't do a very good job of the interview, didn't do a very good job of uh, setting expectations from the beginning. And um, that just created, uh, I don't know, tension and um, an environment that wasn't the most uh, conducive to... Uh, Success and me wanting to come in every day. Um, Tell me about so, the tension. Like, what? Describe. Like, what kind of tension? Like, what happened? So, like, the the as a growing business, the the peop, the person I hired, they were they were going to need to adapt and and maybe do things or uh, not do things um, different than what they were originally hired for. And this individual just, they treat it like it was a union job. This is what I was hired to do. This is what I'm going to do. Um, what were they hired for? To do um, in-house customer service and proofreading. Um, and I was pretty much, I couldn't get them. Then we had grown and, and we needed, I needed them to do more things. And they just didn't want to do them. Um, and that would create that's the tension like uh but at the same time i couldn't i was in a spot where this person was very valuable their their proofreading skills were very valuable um and i couldn't get rid of them either because it's just it was a spot i was in uh so um but the mistake there was probably if I would have set the expectations from the get go this person would have known that hey this is what's expected this is, if if you're hired, this is what's going to happen. You might have to do other things that we're not even talking about right now. But also probably would have d done a more elaborate hiring process, would have gotten more applicants, um, and, and maybe would have hired someone who who would have been a better fit from the beginning. So what do you do now to set expectations with the with, pe with people you hire? Um, well, first of all, we, we, uh, we have an interview process. That's that's more elaborate. Um, we basically have a, a manual, um, and it, we have a better training process, and they know what the expectations are. Um, and I just let them know, you know, we're a small business, and there might be things a year from now that I'm going to ask you to do that we don't we, we haven't even discussed in this interview, and that's just part of being part of a growing business right. um, and I want you to understand that up front yeah so what's 
talking about um, kind of overcoming some of those challenges and mistakes, what's a big milestone that you're especially proud of after you kind of got through some of the challenges and, and a mistake? Well, I would say the the number one milestone would be getting proofreading, proofreading pal to a point where if the business could survive um, if I w- didn't come into work. Um, for the most part, the business could survive without me even being here. Um, that That's a milestone that I didn't see us achieving within three years of launching. Um, that's huge, and so that, yeah. And that encompasses a lot of things. First of all, it means we've got systems in place and, and highly skilled people in place to execute those systems but we also have a big enough customer base now, an advertising budget, to be bringing in revenues that can sustain us, um, and and we have a, a 100% satisfaction. Our 100% satisfaction is what we strive for, and since we since day one, that's what we've uh, pretty much achieved. And so we have a great base of repeat business. Um, so yeah, I, I consider that a milestone. What's a system you put in place that you're especially proud of that allows you to get to to where you are now? Um, whew, there's lots of them. Courtesy call follow-ups is is a system that's uh, that we any new customer they they go into our custom CRM that uh, we've built. They show up as green, and after after we've completed their project, we call them. And we make sure that number one, they got their document. Make sure they don't have any questions or concerns. Make sure they were satisfied, and then ask them questions: why they choose a proofreading service, how they find us, um, and we learn a lot from our customers. And that system right there allows us to learn more from our customers, um, learn things they might want us to improve on, and so we can make those changes to our website. Also acts as a quality control piece, which makes sure that if you know. They weren't satisfied with something. We're going to take care of it, but we also know those the proofreader. We know who the proofreaders were on that, um, so it's a quality control of our proofreaders, and it's also building a relationship with the customer. So it's a um, brand equity, top of mind brand equity piece, and they, it all encompasses. And so, um, and then that's the how to execute this system is in our manual, um, and so one person can be trained on it. Uh, and then if they could take over and start doing these, and they could uh, read the manual it, when they ever encounter a situation that they haven't encountered before. Yeah. What's uh, an important lesson you've learned so far by running the company or your companies? Um, important lesson. Uh, you kind of touched well, on it a second ago when you are talking about... Um, the, the customers. I know that, that you take a lot of pride in that, it seems. Yeah, I, I think over time, the lesson that I have learned is I think if you if you want to be safe and, and know you're always doing the right thing is if you really focus on 100% customer satisfaction and just make that one of your founding principles. Sometimes it's tough. Sometimes a customer, you're just going to have people out there that are difficult. But if you focus on just serving them and then maybe even thinking of ways, okay, this was a really difficult situation, but we took care of it, the customer's satisfied, we would lost money maybe on, on the whole thing. What can we do in the future to either solve this problem from happening again or um, you know you can you can find ways but never leave a customer unsatisfied and it, you're going to keep very high uh, reputation on the internet I don't think you can find anything on the internet that's been said bad about proofreading pal what's I, something I, that you've done that you knew you were going to lose money but you did it anyways just because you knew this customer satisfaction was so important Oh, geez. Well, just like last week, what happened was we had a, a customer that needed a, a decent-sized document back in 36 hours. We promised that. They paid $360 for it. 
um, we made some changes to our website and there was a bug in the system and when we uploaded this it was a large project um, which are kind of separate they don't go through our system we upload them manually well the bug caused the we we can put in days and hours so we put in 36 hours for the turnaround the bug caused the system to say 36 days Wow. so it comes Sunday morning this customer is supposed to have their document back this was just last Sunday and uh, they contact us and where's my document we look and we're like well it's got 35 days left um, she's like no this was 36 hour turnaround um, and so then we, we read through the email records and we find out um, that yeah this was a mistake there's a bug in the system so the customer like demanded it so uh, we what we did is well, first of all okay here's what we're going to do we're going to work with you try to get it back we can get it back by 10 o'clock tonight Still paid the proofreader the two hundred and some dollars they were going to get paid. Still did the project for the customer and refund them the three hundred and sixty dollars. Wow. Now we could have just said we're sorry, we can't. We we're sorry. We're just going to have to refund you. We can't do it. We really apologize. But instead, we we took care of the issue for the customer. And granted, we lost. We net. I mean, we net lost about two hundred and some dollars. But it's a five hundred dollar swing. Um, on our books, mm. and uh, but the nice thing is that customer made it through. They're not going to go out and say bad things about us on the internet. And if you go the refund route um, and and don't satisfy the customer, which a lot of businesses do, eh, you a you lose money, and also the customer is not satisfied. That's too bad. So a lot of times we we have the customer the hundred percent satisfaction guarantee. The customer doesn't require us to refund. A lot of people are reasonable. We work with the customer, fix the little odds and ends that they're asking. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's a little bit outside of what we even promised them, but we just do it. Um, so they're satisfied, they're educated that we probably won't do that again because that's not it's kind of outside of the service we offer. But we don't refund them. We take care of them, and that's just the, that's just the way we do it. Um, yeah. What's this? We, go ahead. We've had we've had people you know we've had times where we've been taken advantage of. We have a 90 minute turnaround and this customer uh, is like $120. We did it 90 minutes, got it back. We did a real good job. Right when they got their document back, they just demanded a refund and said they'll if we don't refund them right now, they're gonna contact the Better Business Bureau and all these things. And uh -huh. so we didn't do anything wrong. Um, there's just people out there like that and. It, just refund them. They go away, and then you protect your your reputation online, which I think is way more important than than one hundred twenty dollars. Oh, for sure. What's uh, Brian? A challenge you had? One of the biggest challenges when you first started? Proofreading pal uh, was uh, first of all I had an investor, but I had limited. We still had limited resources, and um, I'm working growing the business uh, for free, not getting paid, sweat equity uh, to match my investors' uh, investment, and um, trying to grow the business to a point where uh, it's profitable, but also trying to balance my time and and hire someone uh, and uh, and just keep that balance of not getting too much, not spending too much money, but not stunning growth, um, and then also deciding what's a what's something I need to delegate to this person that I've hired to help, and what's something I need to be doing on my own. Um, just that, those little challenges of of growth. That's probably. Um, that was a big challenge. Yeah, it's definitely a different skill set. What did you find early on when you became a manager that kind of helped you, uh, you know, do that different different job, so to speak? I found I was bad at it, uh, first of all, and um, re I read some books on it, and I, I, what I did, you know, I, we've talked about that first hire, and I, it might not it, looking back it might not always be their fault it could be I'm also a poor manager poor communicator still struggle at that um, but read, read some books on on um, on on how to manage and I was what I was doing b before and I and I still do it uh, too much is 
result back to my day, my high school days in athletics and you know basically your coach is your manager and um sometimes i don't think that the the i the management styles of my coaches aren't necessarily uh they don't lend themselves the best way to running a proofreading business but sometimes i try to use those styles I see. Uh, um you know like Take like take a take away bonuses if something's not. I don't know. Make them run laps. Punish. Yeah, it's like it's like running laps. <laughs> uh, and I. What was one just, thing that you did that did work for you, like with your style? Or the um, works now. One thing that I did that. Because everyone has their own style. What uh, what works for your style right now? What what do you find that works with your employees that? How you communicate or something? Well, we 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 have we have goals that we we try to meet, and I make them. Uh, they're not easy to meet, but they're also obtainable. Um, and uh, I think realizing that people are going to make mistakes, and I don't. I uh, want to get mad, but I don't. Uh, I don't get mad, and uh, I don't get as mad as I probably would have three years ago um, and uh, trusting people that they can do the job and you, they don't need to be micromanaged as, as much as I previously thought um, and it's still I guess I'm only I've only been managing people for two years so I I'm still a work in progress and I uh, I still have a long ways to go to become better at that, so I'm not an expert in that. But those are two things that I think goal setting, um, and then I think trying to be the other thing, trying to be cognizant of how much negative feedback you're giving versus positive feedback. Um, it's a, for me, it's so much easier for me to say, "Hey, you missed this. You, look at this email you just sent to this customer. It has a spelling error." Especially with proofreading, right? You have to look at everything. That's a lot of pressure. I know. Versus <laughs> we made a good sale, and it's just like, oh, good. You know, that is, doesn't even get brought up. Right. It's just like some pointing out positives, looking for positives uh, is uh, something that I need to do better at. Yeah. But I would, uh, I think that's that's something that's important. Yeah. So, what's a uh, big challenge now, more recently, that you've grown? Well, now that we're at the point where technically proofreading pal can um, survive on its own, and I'm not spending my day to day in the trenches anymore, it's kind of deciding, okay, what am I going to do with my time now, and how are we going to go to the next level? Because now we're at, you know, I don't. It's just everything's a new new experience. We're trying to go to grow higher and higher and higher. Um, so it's deciding what I'm going to do with my time, how I'm going to spend it, um, and then deciding. You know, right now I'm back to what I'm back to what I really know, and that's running our online advertising campaigns and uh, PR things like this interview here, um, and then really project managing our website development, adding new features, things like that. Mm. Um, the biggest challenge is, okay, which of these items, uh, if we keep growing, I can't do all these items. Right. Um, which do I decide to delegate? The other big challenge is I still I want to stay attached to those in the trenches a little bit um, because I'm afraid if I just get unattached that they'll the quality of those, our customer service, our, our quality of our proofreading will de will disintegrate. Right. Uh, so that's a fear too. So yeah. just trying to. How do you balance all that? Yeah, because you have to balance that. You want to kind of kind of keep your your finger on the pulse of things, but also stick to your core competencies. Yes. So how do you keep? How do you? How are you going to do that? How I don't do you know. <laughs> uh, I think that I think. Uh, <laughs> You, uh, we, I think you gotta have someone. You gotta have some someone who reports to you, 
who can basically you trust that they're responsible for that, and you've got to have people that you can trust, uh, good people yeah. under uh, within your organization. I think that's the key, because um, uh, eventually, if if we want to grow proofreading pal to to where to where it becomes one of the the biggest proof, English proofreading company in the world, um, the the guy at the top cannot be worried about little teeny conversations with customers. Right. That's got to be delegated, or someone else has to be in charge of that. Um, I, you know, I, like I said, I've only been managing people for two years, um, you know, full time employees. So it's it's a challenge yeah. to, to decide. What to do next? Yeah, especially when you're growing quickly and you have tons of contractors and full-time employees, it's it's tough. And I feel like a lot of people that I talk to, a lot of you know founders, say the same thing. Like the things that got them to be that success was having their finger on the pulse of everything and knowing, but then they have to step away and, and focus on their core competencies, which is, you know, then you're not in touch as much. So it's it's hard. Um, and that's another challenge. Uh, Thirty-five contractors now. Yeah. And we definitely are doing a poor job of building relationships with those contractors and making them feel like they're a bigger part of proofreading pal than what they probably feel like they are now. And just the fact that remote workers, you don't most of these people have never uh, spoken on the phone with more than once or twice, um, never met them in person. And uh, so I think that's an area that we could really improve on too and, and if we do improve on that it's going to reduce turnover they're going to buy in more uh, and they're going to work harder for proofreading pal and that's another challenge we have right now yeah so what's the one piece of advice that you'd want to make sure a founder knows to to run their business um I think it's the the uh, well, you're gonna ask me you're gonna ask me the other question about the uh, mentor. Why don't you ask me that question first? Okay. About so, what's mentor. the best advice? Yeah, you know, I, I want to hear your advice from from you, but also what's the best advice you've gotten from a mentor that's been most okay. valuable to you? So, the best advice I got from a mentor was when we kind of started. Growing and and my investors would would be I'd probably say he's somewhat of a mentor. Um, he's really hands off. I mean, he doesn't delve into the proofing pal business at all, um, even though he owns a, a portion of it. But he recommended I read this book called E Myth, and it's it was about systemizing and and documenting and building the manual. Um, and I never even thought about that. I, and I think if we wouldn't have started that process two years ago when we were only one year old, we would not be near as far as we are now. So the, that piece of advice or having me read that book really um, was, was, was important. Um, and so that would be my, I guess to put it as a, from a founder, is to be thinking of, you know, right now you've got your finger on the pulse. But if you you probably have dreams of growing this business to a point where you don't have to have your finger on the pulse, but what are you what steps are you going to take to get from point A where your finger's on the pulse to that point where it's not on the pulse anymore? It's a big challenge, and so you need to kind of be sure you need to be in the day to day thinking what needs to happen next, but also need to be planning maybe for a year out ahead. What are you what what's it going to look like a year from now? Um, and be always working towards that as well. Um, that would be my advice. And so, in my case, two years ago, that was uh, get a, get all of these processes and, and systems that are in my head, little procedures I'm doing myself, get that documented in a manual, and train people with that manual so that uh, someone can start working as a customer service representative without having gone through all the different little experiences, but they can read that manual and figure out how to handle it. Yeah. Um, so that would be my biggest advice to a founder is document what you're doing, make it real simple and easy to read and follow, and it'll pay dividends down the road for sure. Yeah. So 
Brian, I have one final question for you. Before I ask it, I want you to tell the audience a little bit about Proofreading Pal and then what you're working on now that's uh, exciting to you. Okay. Well, so Proofreading Pal is a proofreading and editing service. We um, are available right now seven days a week from 8 a.m. until 10 p.m. It's live customer service, but we proofread and edit 24-7. Um, we offer as fast as three-hour turnaround, and we charge based on how many words are in your document and how soon you need it back. The, thing, the things that make our service unique versus other proofreading services are the fact that we actually use two proofreaders on every document. Um, all of our proofreaders have taken a test to work for us. They're all native English speaking. Many of them have their masters or PhD in English. Yeah, I think I was looking at your site. There was like a couple PhDs on there. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we have just excellent proofreaders. Also, many of many of them have their MFA in creative writing. A lot of them have graduated from University of Iowa Writers Workshop. It's one of the most prestigious writers workshops in the world. And um, we have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Our service provides both proofreading and editing, so we proofread for spelling, grammar, punctuation, capitalization, but then we also edit for sentence structure, clarity, and style, and then finally we make helpful comments and suggestions, and we we do work for all different types of businesses, um, advertising agencies, content creators. We also do a lot of work for uh, graduate students and academia. So what's, it, what's exciting to you now that you're working on with Proofreading Pal? Well, what's exciting to me now is um, really growing our, get, improving our systems again as far as the customer experience. Um, we, the next step, it's crazy three months in, but we, we only allow corporate customers to have login accounts. And so we're moving to ha allowing everybody to have a, a username and password and store their credit card information on file so they don't have to type that in every order. Um, our CRM is getting more advanced. It's allowing us to build better relationships with our customers that way. Um, and then the other exciting thing is uh, we're developing new ways to motivate our outsourced staff. We've got now bonuses in place. If they do so many projects, they can earn bonuses. Um, statistics on which proofreaders are doing how many projects are doing, things like that, which is a, allowing us to promote proofreaders um, maybe a little bit more fairly than we used to. Um, so those are some of the exciting things, and just growing and, and catching up with some of these companies that we once thought were the biggest out there. Now we're, some of them were, you know, I feel like we're almost on equal playing fields. And uh, the next goal is to catch some of the biggest, um, and that's fun. Yeah. Uh, so that's what's exciting. And then I guess the other thing is um, we do have some in, some possible uh, investment opportunities that we have some some people who might be interested in investing in um, not proofreading pal, but but uh, translation pal and transcription pal. Um, and again, I. We talked about not not uh, diluting yourself too much, um, so these ideas would not be pursued unless we get money, uh, substantial money, to go after them. Uh, but that's kind of exciting too because they play along the same lines as what's been successful building proofreading pal, um, and uh, so who knows what that what that might lead to. Yeah, and it's a complementary, you know, exactly to what you do for sure. And um, on another note, on that same note. Uh, my wife loves Proofreading Pal because she um, has a children's book, and before she published it, she sent it to you guys, and she absolutely loved the service. So um, thank you for that. Well, that's <laughs> good to hear, and, and it sounds like her book's already selling really well. Yes, it is. It's doing well so far. Um, so Thanks. the final question I have for you, Brian, is tell me what you learned and maybe uh, a fun story from your lawn mowing business when you were younger. Yeah, so um, I that was back in the day when I didn't uh, focus on customer satisfaction, 100% customer satisfaction. Um, I did have a little lawn mowing business when I was when I was young, um, and uh, I never it never some of these other kids who 
you know, most people, I don't know how old you are when you start a lawn mowing business. I was probably like fourth grade. Um, and there were other fourth graders, but they were like now seniors in high school that they had a pretty successful lawn mowing business. And um, they started when they were in fourth grade. And some of these individuals went into landscaping. They own their own landscaping business. Um, and I just, like fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, I think was when I finally got out of the lawn mowing business. Uh, but I, I could never get it going, and it was because my theory is I just didn't focus on 100% satisfaction. Um, my aunts and uncles were my customers, and uh, you know I'd show up to mow their lawn. It was already mowed because they were tired of waiting for me to come around. Um, and I don't know if that right then and there is where I learned my lesson of almost being being obsessed with customer satisfaction, but. Um, something happened that when I when when I started game rosters uh, in in college and and then on the proofreading pal, just this almost an obsession with customer satisfaction and and uh, maybe it dates back to those mistakes or that laziness when I was a elementary school kid in in my uh, uh, subpar lawn mowing business. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Brian. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for you know, sharing your knowledge so we can uh, be better in our businesses, and everyone should check out, is it proofreadingpal.com? Is that the uh, the website? Yep, okay. proofreadingpal.com. Awesome, Brian. Thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy.